Good afternoon. Muy buenas tardes. This is Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO, 102.7 FM, www.coopradio.org, live on the Internet. This is the Monday Brownbagger, and I'm Alfred Weber. And uh, we'd like to welcome a very special guest today, independent scientist Lorraine Murray, uh, who has been an expert witness at the Tokyo International Tribunal for War Crimes in Afghanistan. And we'd like to welcome her. She's uh, appearing today from Berkeley, California. Welcome. Thank you, Alfred. It's always nice to um, speak to a Canadian audience as well as the larger uh, global audience. So uh, very nice to be on your program again. Thank you. Well, you know, to, today I, I'd like to tell the audience that we're starting a new series uh, here on the Monday Brambagger, and it's called The Economic Takedown of the USA. That is an intentional uh, economic takedown, what we could call an economic false flag operation. And I, I'd like to sort of give a quote uh, to kind of delineate the series. And that is a quote, the subprime mortgage crisis was an economic false flag operation of the Bush administration kleptocracy. Uh, there was a deliberate deregulation leading to the subprime crisis, and in the latter days of the Bush administration, a pseudo bailout whose purpose was the transfer of wealth from the U.S. Treasury to the owners of the U.S. Federal Reserve System, who are as one can see from an ownership chart, the Rothschild City of London interests, end of quote. So uh, this economic takedown of the USA, we're looking at it really in terms of economic war crimes. And I wondered if you could begin to ad address the subprime mortgage crisis and everything that has occurred before and subsequently to that, that's connected to it in terms of an economic war crime by uh, the International War Crimes Racketeering Organization. Well, the U.S. mortgage crisis, um, this isn't the only one and it's not the first one. This occurred in Japan 20 years ago. And um, it was very, very similar, carried out the same way, and of course the same people were behind it, the international financiers or City of London Rothschild interests. So it's just deja vu. And uh, what happened is as inflation continued and property values increased, people were encouraged to borrow money and to buy property, keep it for a year or two years on speculation, and then sell it. Uh, now, doing that, they were assuming that um, the prices would continue to rise. Um, however, uh, that dream collapsed, <laughs> and um, people were, were actually losing their property by foreclosure even six months after they bought it, because property prices were falling. And um, it's, it's affected everything. Pension funds were invested in real estate and um, the stock market. And this is all crashed uh, by 40%. It's devalued by 40%. So um, this has terribly impacted pension funds. And it means that um, people cannot expect the retirement um, payouts that they were expecting. So it's going to force people to work longer and not be able to rot retire as soon as they wanted to. Uh, many, many people have lost their property. Their empty houses all over the United States abandoned. Uh, why in the world did the banks do this? Because... Now these empty houses are going to um, physically degrade, and then uh, people are breaking into them and looting them and damaging them and so forth. So um, the, the bankers were just too greedy, 
and uh, the big gambling casino, which is Wall Street and the housing market and the mortgage uh, scam and everything, has um, come to a roaring halt. And even this has even affected global shipping because that is down 95%. It's just shut down global transportation or global shipping by sea. And um, the, the car um, dealerships have nine months of inventory sitting at the docks. They have to pay for them to be parked in parking lots at the docks. They have nowhere to put them on their, their car lots. And um, so this has really affected everything, even the state of California workers, uh, without hardly any announcement at all, uh, are having two Friday no work days a month now, which is decreasing their monthly salary by at least 9%. So as uh, the economy comes to a screeching halt, people stop spending, they start saving and hoarding money, which is the opposite uh, of what they should be doing to get the, the economy going again. And I think I'd like to read a, a quote by Richard C. Cook. Um, it's from his article called Extraordinary Times, Intentional Collapse, and Takedown of the USA. Um, it was published on September 5th, 2008. It's very, very recent. And um, as um, a U.S. federal government analyst who worked in many departments of the U.S. government, he really has a very good um, knowledge of how the government works. So this is what he said, quote, As the 20th century advanced, the financier elite became heavily involved in getting rich off World War and the manufacture of the new weapons of mass destruction that modern technology made possible. Warfare and weaponry combined with control of credit manufactured through the leveraging of industrial production were to be the primary means of putting nations and their populations into debt. A materialistic slave society was being created, which books like 1984 warned against. Humanity was lured into compliance through the fantasy world brought about by the mass media by means of advertising, cinema, and television. Another enticement was the growing availability of mass-produced consumer goods. And so what's happened is we're losing industrial production. Um, we are turning into a police state. 9-11 is what triggered and initiated the, the introduction of the police state. We have been lured into this fantasy world uh, through the, um, the newspapers and mass media, which is controlled by the ruling elite, and um, advertising and movies and TV, which are presenting a world that isn't real. And, um, and then the enticement of, of, of acquiring things, mass-produced consumer goods, is also grinding to a halt. As we can see, just wait another year or two years um, with the shutdown of uh, uh, international shipping. So now China is stuck with all this production, all these production facilities, and nowhere to sell their goods. And this is not just affecting the U.S. It's affecting, affecting the whole world because uh, oil prices have been um, in dollars. And 80% of commerce around the world is conducted in dollars. So as dollar, the dollar value drops, um, it, it really dents um, the economies of, of, well, the global economy. It, it affects all countries. So um, it's, it's unprecedented. This is on a scale that's never happened before. Right. So, um, uh, just just kind of going on, going on from there. Why would you call 
what is occurring now a false flag operation in the same way that 9-11, September, the, the attack, quote, attack, was actually a false flag operation. That is, it was an inside job in order to, uh, with certain, uh, conducted by uh, covert elements of uh, the U.S. administration, the Bush administration, and the military in, intelligence complex. Well, let's for, for just, certain reasons. Let's just um, let's just go back to the definition of a false flag operation. Uh, by definition, it is covert operations conducted by governments, corporations, or other organizations which are designed to deceive the public in such a way that the operations appear as though they are being carried out by other entities. The name is derived from the military concept of flying false colors, that is, flying the flag of a country other than one's own. False flag operations are not limited to war and counterinsurgency operations, and they have been used in peacetime. Well, for example, um, for example, 9/11. Uh, for example, the Mumbai bombings. For example, the um, um, uh, the bombings in in London. Um, these are all false flag operations carried out for different purposes. But the purpose of 9/11 was because the internationalists were impatient with the, the rate of change that was occurring uh, to in, in, in their plans to implement a new world order or a one world government. And so the 9-11 um, the uh, false flag event was carried out to accelerate the rate of change. And it certainly did. It also drove the dollar up, the value of the dollar. Right. So we, we've begun to define the Bush administration, which set up the conditions for the false flag event as a, as a kleptocracy. What do you see as that term? What? Well, uh, a kleptocracy is... Well, I'll, I'll give you the definition of that. Um, the root of klepto uh, plus kratine, that, that's the root of kleptocracy, is it, it just means rule by thieves. And it's a term applied to a government that extends the personal wealth and political power of government officials and the ruling class, which we would collectively call kleptocrats at the expense of the population. And so what they're doing is stripping the wealth of the citizens and the country and the, um, the citizenry um, to concentrate wealth upwards and, um, and consolidate their control and power over um, the, the, um, the citizens of, of a country, or, or in this case, it's global. It's, it's the whole global community that's being stripped, not just the United States. But the international financiers who are behind it, the city of London, Rothschild interests, have always had a big grudge against Russia and against the United States because they were very, very strong Christian countries and the U.S. and Russia have been very deep friends for many centuries. People don't really realize that. Uh, Russia and the United States are really pretend enemies, and they are actually secret collaborators. For instance, during the Cold War on exotic weapons development, the HARP system. And so, um, the Soviet Union was, or Russia was targeted uh, with the Bolshevik. Revolution, which was funded by Wall Street financiers. Jacob Schiff, who was CEO of Kuhnloeb and whose family had intermarried with the Rothschilds in Frankfurt 
in the 1700s, they shared a house together, and so their children intermarried. And so the Schiff family um, actually represents the Rothschild interest. They're the same entity. And <clears throat> so these, um, these international financiers, in order to grab the wealth and steal it and, and to concentrate it upwards, they have to carry out these different kinds of uh, operations, intelligence operations, false flag operations, in order to bully and frighten and intimidate and psychologically manipulate populations that uh, they want to steal things from. Right. Now, I'm, I'm uh, be beginning to look at uh, the, the chart of who owns the Federal Reserve. Why is that important, who owns the Federal Reserve system? Well, um, the reason that Russia and the United States have been targeted by the international financiers is because Christianity prohibited usury and money lending and, and banking um, from the time that, uh, of Christ. And it wasn't until the 1700s that um, the Pope um, would not allow money changing or usury, and the the people, Muslim people or people of Islam, are not allowed to practice banking or usury today. So, um, in the 1700s, for some reason, the Pope reversed the Catholic position, the Catholic Church position, and, and allowed banking. And um, and so very, very strong Christian countries, Russia and the United States in the 17 and 1800s, would would, even though Christianity allowed banking, they did not want the international financiers from the city of London, the Rothschild interest, setting up central, central banks in their countries. And the Federal Reserve has nothing to do with the U.S. federal government it's a private central bank, and it serves the interests of the international financiers um, in the city of London, and, um, and it's privately owned. And that chart that you have of, of who owns the Federal Reserve Bank is very, very interesting. Why don't you um, bring up some of the names on it? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just read from, from, from this. For those who are who are listening, uh, you can Google uh, just Google International Citizens 9/11 War Crimes Tribunal, uh, and you'll go there and you'll see right at the top there there's a um, a, a whole uh, web page for this co-op radio program called the Economic Takedown of the United of the USA Part One. And in there, there'll be a link. Uh, there's a whole number of links, and there's one to who owns the Federal Reserve, and it's a it's a very um, uh, it's a it's a chart that is uh, essentially has not changed much uh, over the past number of decades. And I'll just read from it. Uh, it says chart one reveals the linear connection between the Rothschilds and the Bank of England and their London banking houses, which ultimately control the Federal Reserve Banks through their stock holdings of bank stock and their subsidiary firms in New York. The two principal Rothschild representatives in New York, J.P. Morgan and Kuhn Loeb and Company, were the firms which set up the Jekyll Island Conference at which the Federal Reserve Act was drafted, uh, who, who directed the subsequent successful campaign to have the plan enacted into law by Congress and who purchased the controlling amounts of stock in the Federal Reserve Bank. And so if you, if you go um, uh, and it, uh, through this chart, which I urge you to do, it's quite, quite extensive uh, and it names uh, people and it names, um, you know, principles quite extensively. And you go to the top of the chart, it traces ultimate ownership to N.M. Rothschild, London, Bank of England. 
uh, who owns uh, the the controlling interest in all of the uh, banks that own the the uh, Federal Reserve. So it's a virtual octopus leading back to the Rothschilds. And I should say that there's documented evidence that the net worth of the Rothschild Holdings is $100 trillion, at least. And just to name some names, from Rothschild, it goes down to the J. Henry Shorter Banking Corporation. I happened to work for them um, in 1962. In the summer of 62, I got a, a job there as a messenger on Wall Street for the summer. I was a, a, a sophomore in college and paid me 50 bucks a, a week. At the other side, there's Brown Shipley and Company, and that goes all the way down to Brown Brothers Harriman, which you've heard of. That was the um, the company which financed Adolf Hitler, among others. And, Another Rothschild and, interest. Yes, it, it financed the Bolsheviks. So um, uh, here we're dealing with the instrumentality that was used i.e. the Federal Reserve, that was used to carry out, which is a private bank. There's, I think it was Dennis Kucinich who just said, the Federal Reserve Bank is as federal as Federal Express. FedEx, yeah, right. A private company. Right. So the Federal Reserve Bank was used and is still being used to carry out the economic false flag operation against the United States of America with the purpose of taking it down. And I wondered if you could begin to elaborate on the mechanisms of how that's being done from your knowledge. Well, um, basically, the bankers use weapons of mass destruction and other exotic technologies to engineer banking crises through false flag operations. And when I got a, uh, well, let's, let's just talk about the mechanisms for how they do it. They uh, create uh, depressions um, and banking disasters. They just pull all the strings and they happen, which result in famines. There was a huge famine in Russia engineered by the Bolsheviks and Stalin in um, between 1932 and 1933, and 5 million, uh, mostly Ukrainians, starved to death. It was just incredible. How could 5 million Ukrainians starve to death when it was the breadbasket of Russia? Russia? And, um, and that results in depopulation. The same exact thing happened in the United States between 1932 and 33. Now, Stalin wanted to take back the land that he had uh, sort of bribed peasants with to join in the Bolshevik Revolution. He gave them land to farm, and then in the 1930s, he wanted to set up communes, and he wanted that land back. They didn't want to give it back. They wanted to pass it on to their children. So he just simply starved them to death. And um, in the United States, it, the, tar the farmers were the target of the Depression, the, the famine between 1932 and 33, And they were well-to-do farmers. Um, the banks foreclosed on them. They were thrown out into the streets with their families. Seven million farmers. Um, and a million families, their families, were out in the streets starving to death. And over six million people starved to death in the U.S. between 1932 and 33. And what the U.S. government did was they slaughtered six and a half million pigs and burned the meat so that no one could get it who was starving. And any food that was not paid for in stores was picked up and thrown overboard or buried or burned so that starving people could not eat that. And so both the Russian and the U.S. famine were carried out exactly the same way for exactly the same reason uh, for a land grab. 
and Harold Ikes, who was um, uh, in the in the cabinet of um, uh, President Roosevelt, was the person who engineered the 1932-33 famine, and he was also responsible for uh, another land grab in World War II, which was to take the um, the farmland away from Japanese Americans by putting them in concentration camps. So these are deliberately engineered. People are deliberately starved to death. They create environmental disasters, and um, and then uh, there there are methods they use to eliminate co- competitors. Um, they are now exploring for mineral deposits from satellites. Bechtel has mapped a lot of mineral deposits around the world using radio tomography from, from satellites. And, um, and so they displace people or they starve them out or they use biological weapons, ethnic-specific bioweapons where they can t- target tribes or ethnic groups or whatever to get rid of them, and that's exactly what we're, we've been practicing in Iraq and Afghanistan and Yugoslavia was to contaminate their countries completely with radiation and destroy future generations. We're doing the same thing in the Congo, in the Sudan, and Somalia. And these are all for land grabs and resource grabs. Now, um, very recently, I took uh, a map, I mean a graph, of monthly crude oil prices, and uh, this is from 1946 to 2009. And don't ask me why I did it. I just yeah. Could I could sure. I just jump in be, be, to to say that this uh, this chart is also online. If you go to the uh, just Google International 9/11 War Crimes Tribunal, and it'll bring you right up to that website, and at the top uh, in the uh, co-op radio, the economic takedown of the USA Part 1, in the article appears uh, this chart of uh, oil prices linked to the decline of the dollar, 1946 to 2009. Okay, Loren, could you tell us more about this? Yes. Um, So what I did was I I plotted... um, the false flag operations and, and phony wars that um, have occurred since the 1973 oil crisis, uh, which Kissinger was involved with. And that is um, very interesting because between 1946 and 1973, oil prices were very low and very stable, and there was hardly any increase at all. Uh, basically, it's a flat line. But in 1973, the oil crisis occurred, and uh, the Yom Kippur War in Israel in the Golan Heights against Arab tanks uh, was um, um, sort of the first time that oil prices jumped after that, that excursion. And it was also the introduction of depleted uranium weapons to the battlefield because the U.S. gave Israel... Uh, depleted uranium weaponry and supervised them using it in the Yom Kippur War, and they just wiped out the Egyptian and Arab tanks uh, like in five days. But they also completely contaminated the Golan Heights in Israel with a pernicious permanent poison. And uh, uranium is especially devastating for women because it causes infertility and reproductive cancers of the um, ovaries, the uterus, and um, the ovaries, the uterus, and uh, well, re- reproductive cancers anyway, breast cancer. So that was the beginning of the uranium wars. It was 1973, the Yom Kippur War. Now, uh, oil prices. Um, well, actually, when the dollar declines, that's when they engineer the wars to drive the dollar up, um, and also oil prices go up as the um, the dollar goes up. So, the next uh, 
uh, big hike in oil prices, which strengthened the dollar, was the 1979-1980 um, is when the Iran-Iraq War started, which we uh, funded both sides and armed both sides, and we didn't care whether Iran or Iraq won that war, but that really drove oil prices up. And then they started falling again um, to uh, 1986. They were very low, almost down to the, um, the pre-1973 prices. And Chernobyl happened. Now, Chernobyl was engineered. It was a false flag operation carried out by, uh, for sure, the CIA, probably the Mossad was involved, and MI6, uh, British Intelligence. You, you mean that these agencies actually sabotaged the Chernobyl nuclear plant? Yes, they did. Um, or they had Russians inside the plant who were instructed on in, in how to do it. And a uh, an Indian uh, admiral told me he had inspected nuclear power plants all over Russia. He said, it's impossible for Chernobyl to have been an accident because 12 levels of safety measures to prevent an accident like that had to be dismantled in order, um, in, in, a, in a certain sequence in order for Chernobyl to happen. He said, quite frankly, Chernobyl was carried out to end the Cold War. And it certainly did, rush, did turn Russia into a sick old man. The radiation illness even today is, is uh, horrible all over Russia from Chernobyl. So that drove oil prices up for a while. Um, and, um, and then Gulf War I in 1990, at the end of 1990, really drove oil prices up again, higher than, um, than the Yom Kippur War. But then they started falling again, and um, the Yugoslavian War of 1995, uh, sort of eased the prices up again. And when they started to fall by 1998, they were low again. Uh, the NATO attack on Yugoslavia significantly drove uh, oil prices up. And then they started falling again. So in 2001, we had 9-11. Uh, and since 9-11, oil prices have just gone to um, historic highs that it, it's the highest the highest oil prices in history. Now, now they, they started falling again uh, between, in about 2006. So um, the Israeli attack on Lebanon was carried out in the summer of 2006, and that drove oil prices up to, um, just to a real peak. Now they've started, they started falling again uh, in 2008 precipitously. And um, and so we we've, we've got the Gaza attack. Right. So if this if this chart follows, then you you would predict that there was that that the that the that the forces behind the petroleum industry, the owners of oil, uh, would. Uh, would seek to drive up the price of oil if we're still on the oil war cycle by engaging in another major war. Is that well? Yeah. Let me just quote Richard Berta, who was the West, he was the Western Regional Inspector for the Inspector General's Office at the Department of Energy when I became a whistleblower um, and went to him with complaints about fraud and, and contractor fraud at Livermore in November of 1991. And he said to me, look, the nuclear weapons labs exist for the Pentagon, and the Pentagon exists for the oil companies. So how much more succinct can you be than that, Alfred? And this history of oil prices, 1946 to 2009 on this chart, is linked to the decline of the dollar. And um, Matthias Chang, um, the former secretary and economic advisor to Toon Dr. Mahathir, the former prime minister of Malaysia, who invited 
you and I to Malaysia two years ago, um, uh, Matthias was kind enough to explain what this chart really meant. Um, he said, whenever the dollar value declines, there is less demand for the dollar and puts the dollar at risk as the global reserve currency. The price of oil is hiked up with a war or a false flag to create a demand for dollars as all oil trade and over 80% of world trade is denominated in dollars. Whenever the Federal Reserve, the private bank you just explained, prints money and floods the market with paper, which devalues the dollar, watch out for a price hike in oil. And when the excess oil is mopped up by the Arab OPEC consortium, the oil price goes down. Parallel to this is also the need to have armed conflict, as this is in tandem with hiking the oil price, which will also ensure a demand for oil. And that's exactly what this chart shows. Uh, dollars equal war plus oil. So, uh, uh, well, now, there, I, I've seen uh, parallel theories advance or speculation that the precipitous price of drop in the price of oil now is really to attempt to bankrupt the OPEC economies. Well, that, that's certainly true. And by driving the oil prices uh, down, um, um, let's see, by driving them down, oh, well, well, when the oil prices go down, then um, the, the U.S. government and the international financiers want to drive them back up again because they, they make the money. And um, the, the, the poor global population is paying more and more and more for energy consumption. And that is how they concentrate wealth upwards. It's by maximizing profits. It's a way to steal money from um, the, the, the populations around the world. And um, since they control the money game, um, they can do anything they want to. Uh, so, as Kissinger said, just just a moment. Yeah. As Kissinger said, um, if you control the food, you control a nation. If you control the energy, you control a region. But if you control the money, the banking, the financing, you control the whole world. Right. And so when you're saying they they control, we can really identify that they now, which goes back to the chart of the ownership of the Federal Reserve, that identifies the they as the stakeholders behind the International War Crimes Racketeering Organization and the stakeholders behind the permanent war economy who keep this going, who have targeted the U.S. for economic takedown. And, and two of the best articles to explain the, the complexity of, of, for instance, 9-11 as economic terrorism and uh, this mortgage crisis and everything that's related to it, uh, it, it's another economic false flag operation and intentional takedown and collapse of the U.S. These, these, this is all state-sponsored terrorism. And Richard Cook wrote this article, which is posted on your website, Extraordinary Times, Intentional Collapse and Takedown of the USA, which explains uh, really very clearly the relationship between the U.S. and Russia and how banking and, and bankers use uh, wars and debt and financing to, um, to create uh, a, a slavery society. And then uh, General Ivashov, who was in charge of, he was chief of staff of the entire Russian military when 9-11 happened, um, he wrote a very, very succinct and very good article about two and a half pages long, International Terrorism Does Not Exist, and that's on your site also. 
and so what he explained is um, the dynamic of uh, false flag operations, and he said they cannot exist without intelligence agencies funding and controlling them and protecting them. He said the U.S. is the most protected country in the world, and the Pentagon is probably the most protected building in the world. And so he said 9-11 um, could only have been carried out by uh, intelligence agencies and maybe some politicians or uh, the oligarchy in the U.S. And so it was really carried out by the CIA, the Mossad, the U.S. military, and MI6. It, it, was, uh, it was an international economic terrorist event. Well, given, if we take the example, using that parallel of the Soviet Union and the United States in 1932 and 1933, uh, where in the Soviet Union, I think the, the, the total number of deaths in the Soviet Union caused by the internal Bolsheviks uh, or the uh, state party apparatus kind of on internal genocide was approximately 66 million. Is, is, that, is that a correct figure? Oh, in 1932, 32. Well, no, through, throughout... Oh. The Bolsheviks murdered yeah. almost 70 million ethnic Christian Russians. And in World War II, uh, General Dwight David Eisenhower was sent to Germany. He was at the bottom of the list of generals. Um, he was a West Point graduate. My grandfather was at West Point with him. And he was a very mediocre officer. Uh, Eisenhower was, but he became friends with Bernard Baruch, who was extremely influential uh, under a number of presidents and certainly in World War II, and he was a Wall Street banker, and Bernard Baruch uh, actually facilitated uh, Dwight Eisenhower's rise through the ranks and to commanding posts and, and finally into the presidency. And so it was Bernard Baruch who uh, influenced the transfer of Eisenhower to Germany right after the Germans surrendered. And it was Dwight Eisenhower who set up death camps and was responsible for starving to death deliberately five million ethnic Christian Germans. Now, why do you think Eisenhower did that? He hated Germans. But, I mean, is there a connection to the greater subject that, 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 we're, that we're talking about, i.e., the international banking realms, or is that it is, it is yeah, It is directly connected to them, and all of the problems in Germany started um, before World War I when they refused to have uh, central banks. They did not want central banks in Germany because Germans are very... Germany is a very Christian country also. And so all of these countries and the, the, the t horrible bashing they've experienced, Germany and, and the, Russia and now the U.S. is going through the same thing. It's, they're going to destroy the United States. Um, it's all related to bankers' interests. Okay. Now, this, this, this gets to your point because you just said, quote, they're going to destroy the United States. Now, if we, go, if we look at what Cook says, he says, well, we could have a transformation of the monetary system with a guaranteed national income, a bank that would put money directly into circulation, you eliminate fractional reserve systems, uh, uh, and you uh, uh, have a bankruptcy reorganization of the entire $50 trillion of existing debt in the U.S., okay? So that there's a way to solve it. But what you're saying is that they're, quote, they, namely the international banking interests that we've identified now on the chart, they're actual names. They could be served and prosecuted in a court of law. They're going to destroy 
the United States. Could you state how and why and when you think? Well, they're uh, they're driving people out of their homes by by foreclosing on mortgages. Um, they um, all these wars that they've engineered um, have have resulted in the U.S. and NATO becoming the military proxies for Wall Street and the city of London financiers. And these uranium wars, which started in 1991 by the U.S., have uh, medically disabled over one million soldiers and National Guardsmen from our states. Now, why are they sending National Guardsmen to wars overseas when the National Guard is meant to serve the needs for natural disasters and, and other, other purposes in our states. What they're doing is killing our National Guardsmen and our military, and this will allow and enable and minimize the resistance to foreign troops, UN troops, they're already here in the U.S., coming in and taking over. Now, um, in World War II, when uh, the when the, um, the the Japanese Americans were rounded up, listen to this. Um, the um, the first stage of the operation took only 72 hours between 1941 and 42. They they rounded up the the um, ethnic Japanese Americans and stuffed them in concentration camps. Well, those concentration camps had been constructed uh, some time before and were sitting there waiting to be filled up. Uh, KBR and Halliburton, KBR is a subsidiary of Halliburton, and other contractors have built over 800 concentration camps in the United States throughout the U.S., and there's a very, very large facility that will hold a million people in Alaska. And that's supposed to be the, the mental, um, the mental um, gulag, which is similar to what Stalin created in Siberia in World War II. And so we just see the same things being repeated over and over again. It's like it's all on the front page. There's nothing secret about it. Why would they build 800 concentration camps if they're not going to fill them up and use them? Of course they're going to. And those concentration camps, were started illegally, just like the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Military Agency, was illegally started by Colonel Oliver North. The Iran-Contra money and, and um, arms and drug sales and everything, that money went to begin construction of these concentration camps in the U.S. And it's never stopped. They've continued constructing them since, uh, Oliver North. Well, F F yeah, F FEMA is now called the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Well, they just um, they just put a candy coating. Now, on. now, now, just to to continue on that, I'm 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 reading here from an article that says numerous states introduce legislation uh, which uh, which set out the conditions from seceding from the United States. Uh, and that is that, uh, for example, the states, the legislatures of New Hampshire and Washington State have introduced bills declaring they will not submit to the United States government if the federal government acts unconstitutionally. And uh, this is pursuant to the 10th Amendment of the Constitution that all powers not expressly delegated to the federal government are reserved to to the states, uh, and they're they're identical to the bills in California, Oklahoma, and other states. Now, do you think this is part of a movement of balkanization of the United States? Um, I think so. And what I see is um, uh, the I see the ten regions emerging from this uh, that that. Uh, Reagan declared under executive order. He divided the United States into ten regions. And what they want to do is to destroy democratic government. So they want, want to get rid of city, county, state governments. 
and replace it with administrative um, bodies that that administer what's going on, but there's no participation by the citizens. This is basically what they've done in Europe with the EU. And, um, and they're also uh, doing something called fusion, which is pulling in the firefighters and the police into a federal structure, and the the cities and the states are mandated to continue paying for them, but they have no jurisdiction over them. Well, for for example, now a number of the states are beginning to pay in script, that is in in IOUs. Yes. Such that uh, uh, civil servants, firemen, police, welfare recipients, et cetera, will begin to receive IOUs. Is this the part of the collapse of the state of the uh, of the state system of the United States? It's bankrupting all the states. The states are um, something like forty six states are are on the verge of bankruptcy. Yeah, so and this is the result of intentional economic warfare. This is a false flag economic operation. This is a false flag ec- ec- economic operation. So why doesn't the commander in chief Barack Obama identify it as such? Well, because he's part of it. The 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 whole point of having a two a two party system in the United States is because it's much more stable than a single party system. With a single party system, it's very easy to overthrow or toss out whoever the um, the ruler or dictator or whatever you want to call them is, with a two-party system where you have Democrats and Republicans running against each other, they're actually the same party. But it's just a smoke and mirrors um, uh, dog and pony show to trick the public into thinking they're actually voting and they really have a choice. And so each time, whatever party they're angry at they can vote them out, vote the rascals out, and bring this this other party in. But what they're doing is they're getting the same dinner from both parties, no matter who they vote for. And the whole point of all of it, this charade, is to make sure that the elitists have no change in their uh, their agenda, whatever is being rolled out. So the so the outcome. What what would you predict would be the outcome of eight years of an Obama presidency? Um, well, a lot more people are going to lose their jobs. A lot more people are going to be homeless. Uh, there are tent cities. I've seen them outside of Reno, Nevada. Uh, they're turning parking lots into, uh, they call them hostels in Los Angeles for people living in their cars. I see homeless people everywhere. Right, and and in terms of the of the constitutional structure of the states, I mean, the U.S. Constitution is structurally composed of fifty states, which are uh, sovereign entities. But if those entities are bankrupt, then how does the United States itself evolve? What what happens to it? Well, then, an um, then the the states um, are bankrupt, and so then it's much easier for the federal government to impose law and order, and this um, this uh, ten region country that they want to create with um, administrative leadership rather than elections. Um, this is this is what they did in Europe. It's what, basically what the EU is. And so you right, just, right. You just so, see people so that, getting poorer and poorer. Exactly. So that then one there's an erosion of constitutional rights, an erosion of electoral rights, an erosion of state rights. There won't be any rights. Uh huh. And how do you think that we're just in the last few minutes here? But how do you think that such a devolving United States will relate to Canada in terms of the North American Union, etc. Well, what they want to do is to um, impoverish Mexico, the U.S., and Canada, and 
by doing that and starving people, it's much easier to take over. And people who are starving are much more willing to go along with an agenda that that, that is going to um, give them shelter and uh, food. And and so that's what they're going to do. It's it's to um, it's to create um, hunger and famine and fear, and to uh, make to make people submit to whatever the agenda is. Right, right. Now, and religion is also used for that. Religion is used to as a mechanism to um, create submission of of um, countries people in countries right well we're we're beginning to to we we have just a, a few minutes left in this part we'd like to continue in in a second part and uh, come up with um, some of the thinking of of authors like Joseph Stiglitz who are recommending that the banks just fail well, they they should just declare bankruptcy. They should walk away from all that debt globally, and then and then what can the the international financiers do? If right. everybody walks off their chessboard, what can they do? We need to decentralize food. We need to decentralize water and power, and every city. The citizens in every city should own their own water company and their own energy company. And the um, food consumption, it should be produced locally. Good. Well, uh, we'll, we'll end the, the conversation here on that note and perhaps in part two come back with uh, looking at the long history of state-engineered famine and land grabs and really go in-depth into the Russian famine and that history, which we know was engineered by the international bankers, and see how they're in-depth engineering it in North America. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank, thank you, Alfred. Thank you very much. We've been with Lorraine Murray, uh, who's an expert witness at the Inter um, Tokyo International Tribunal for war crimes in Afghanistan. She's an independent scientist, and we've just been listening to part one of the economic takedown of the USA. For more information um, and to listen to a audio archive of these programs, please um, Google International War Crimes, 9-11 War Crimes, Tribunal, and you'll come to a summary of this program. This is Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO, 102.7 FM, www.coopradio.org. This is the Monday Brown Bagger. I'm Alfred Weber. May you have a wonderful and miracle-filled day. Thank you.